Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Flyaway Nights um, with Yola Basin Foundation. And uh, I'm really pretty excited about our program this evening because in our demonstration area now, we have these amazing new fish, um, Sacramento perch, and um, our friends from Fish and Wildlife will be sharing with us, uh, Claire and Max, about why they're here, why we have fish in our demonstration area, uh, or specifically why we have these Sacramento perch. I also, before we get started on our actual program, want to make sure that you remember that our next big event is California Duck Days, right around the corner, last Saturday of this month. And um, maybe you wanna come, maybe you're like this wood duck here and you're gonna bring your kids and, uh, it should be a real fun day. All outdoors, lots of activities to do, um, and many of our uh, fellow agencies around the area um, that will be coming and helping us put this thing on. And maybe you also want to volunteer. Um, there are still openings for people who are interested in helping us to make Duck Days happen. And then this is our final Flyway Nights of the Year. So Flyway Nights is a speaker series that runs November through April on the first Thursday. So uh, beginning to make plans for next year and hoping that you mark your calendar to join us. So I'm going to stop my share and let Max put his back up. And we will be turning over the program. I understand Claire is going to be our first presenter to start. So I'm going to pass the baton. Thank you, Corky, and thanks everyone for joining. My name is Claire Engel. Um, Max and I work in the fisheries branch uh, for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and we're both in the Native Fishes Conservation and Management Program. At this point, I'm going to turn off my video just so that nothing happens with my bandwidth, um, but hopefully you can keep hearing me. So Max has been working on this species for eight years and I joined the Sacramento Perch team three years ago. And we have lovingly tagged the Sacramento Perch as native sport fish of the people. And we hope that the presentation will show you why we have chosen this phrase to describe this interesting and important species. Um, in the latter half of the presentation, we're gonna be focusing in, uh, Max is gonna be focusing in on the unique population that now exists at the YOLO headquarters ponds. Um, and before that, I'm gonna give you some more introductory information about this, this really amazing fish. Next slide, please, Max. Hey, Sacramento perch is the only centrarchid species native to California. They were historically found throughout the Central Valley, the Pajaro, Pajaro and Salinas Rivers and Clear Lake in Lake County. Their original habitat included slow moving rivers, sloughs, and lakes with nearby structure and submerged vegetation. And their native distribution was likely established during the Miocene period before the emergence of the Sierra and the Rocky Ranges. Next slide. A little bit of background about the species. They reach sexual maturity at two to three years old and they can live up to nine years or even older. Sacramento perch can grow to substantial sizes, though a more common size range for adult fish is about 20 to 35 centimeters, which is about eight to 14 inches. And California's history of alternating periods of flooding and drought selected for their ability to withstand pretty extreme salinities, temperature, and alkalinities, which typically exclude introduced fish that have evolved under different conditions. And as a result, Sacramento perch can survive in broader water quality conditions than other centrarchids that have been introduced from the eastern part of the country, which include lar largemouth bass, bluegill, green and red ear sunfishes, pumpkin seed, and crappie species. Next slide. So among being one of uh, California's native species that evolved with the um, geology and climate and ecology, uh, Sacramento perch 
served as a staple fish food for native Californians, including Ohlone, Bay Miwok, Wapo, Potwin, and Yakutsk people, as you can see on the map on the right hand of the slide. This represents the San Francisco Bay and part of the Delta, and you can see all of the different areas where these people lived. Um, also, they served as a primary fish food for early settlers before game fish were introduced from the Eastern United States in the late 1800s. The painting on the left is a depiction of Prue Ristock, a Ramaytush Ohlone village in what is now Pacifica. This was painted by Amy Hosa and Linda Yamani, and Linda is an Ohlone artist that has brought back much of the language and culture of her people. Fish remains have been found in historic midden deposits from such villages and show that Sacramento perch were abundant in the Bay Delta region and also a crucial food source to its indigenous people. Bay Miwok fin people fished primarily with nets from tule rafts and the Northern Valley Yakuts people of the San Joaquin Valley fished for Sacramento perch using small drag nets with stone sinkers at the bottom. Next slide, please. And interestingly, other cultural and geologic discoveries have been inferred from Sacramento perch made and remains, which are really important um, to the species itself. For example, 700 to 2,500 year old remains were rediscovered from midden, recovered, sorry, from middens in the Salinas and Pajaro rivers. This is the map on the left side of your screen. And this demonstrated that Sacramento perch were naturally occurring in these rivers and not introduced as previously thought because there was some separation between the bay and these rivers. Also, um, on the right map, you can see the Emigdiano territory, which lies south of Buena Vista Lakes and Kern Lakes. And Emigdiano Chumash sites in Southern California have been found to contain Sacramento perch remains as well, which means that fishing or trading likely occurred with Yakutsk people who lived around Kern and Buena Vista Lakes in the southern extent of the Sacramento perch's native range. Next slide, please. By the end of the 19th century, Sacramento perch observations that were previously described as abundant were becoming uncommon or scarce, and presumably mainly due to the combination of habitat changes and displacement by introduced non-native species. So catfish, largemouth bass, and other sunfish and carp were all introduced into California during this time period, and Delta reclamation was already several decades underway. By the 1930s, the Department of Fishing Game staff were describing the need to rehabilitate the species through stocking, so there was already an urgent need recognized. And by the 1950s, the endemic estuarine populations were largely absent. Um, and by the 1960s, even extensive surveys only detected a handful of Sacramento perch in Clear Lake. Stocking activities for this fish started in the 1940s through the production from Central Valley Fish Hatchery and the utilization of other broodstock sources as well, and continued through the 1970s. Next slide, please, Max. So as mentioned before, um, non-native fish are a big problem for Sacramento perch. They do not compete well with other non-native fish for food or habitat and engage in less aggressive nest defending behavior than other fish species. Sacramento perch is outcompeted particularly by non-native centrarchid species when present within the same environment. So the picture on the left um, is a bluegill, it's one of its biggest competitors. And alongside the introduction of non-native competitors, their preferred habitat has also been significantly altered, including the filling of sloughs and the reduction of shallow backwater areas. Remaining Sacramento perch populations generally have been introduced, and there is no longer natural gene flow between isolated populations. And increases in severity of drought, as we're experiencing now, have also threatened and extirpated some of the remaining Sacramento perch populations. 
As is the case for many of our species, they're well adapted to, adapted to California, but California has changed significantly as well. Um, so the department recognizes Sacramento perch as a species of special concern and a species of greatest conservation need. Next slide, Max. So back to their amazing um, water quality abilities, because of these abilities to, to survive in high alkalinity waters, Sacramento perch were introduced into several alkaline lakes in Nevada, Colorado, Nebraska, and North and South Dakota, also Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Many of these populations are now extirpated, but robust introduced populations remain in California and Nevada in locations where most other centrarchid species can't survive and reproduce well. Next slide. And in California, this has resulted in most extant Sacramento perch populations being shifted east of their native distribution. On the left side of the slide, you can see what their native distribution was. And on the right side of the slide is um, our current best known information about the um, stocked and extant populations. Each pin represents an area where Sacramento fish have been introduced or stocked, and the green pins represent populations that are either extant or very recently extant, based on the best known latest information. So you can see that most of the populations within their native range are no longer around, even under the extensive stocking that occurred um, between the 1940s and 1970s. Several populations have become established in California reservoirs where they've been translocated into colder, higher elevation areas, or where young fish were transported through the California aqueduct system into holding reservoirs such as the San Luis Reservoir. The department has, so even though there's been a lot of stocking, most of these introductions have failed. And this map doesn't even represent all of the introductions that have happened. These are just water bodies that are still named the same and that we can find. Lots of stocking happened in farm ponds as well, which are harder to track down. And the populations that currently are present in their native range have been more recently introduced, including the population at Yolo headquarters. Next slide. All right, thanks, Clara. That was uh, some really fantastic background information. Um, so now I wanted to um, transition and talk about some ongoing management activities in California. Um, the first being genetic assessment. In 2008, Schwartz and May came out with a paper that uh, assessed the genetics of several populations in California and Nevada. And a few late years later, the department made the determination that it would be valuable to add some additional waters to this list. Um, and so in 2017, we went out and collected tissue samples from some additional waters and through a SWIG grant or a state wildlife grant, worked with UC Davis again in the genomic variation lab and had those additional waters assessed as well. And this led to the designation of two divergent management units uh, that we refer to as the North Management Unit here in the red icons and the South Management Unit in the blue icons. So in addition to the genetic work, we've also um, been conducting conservation translocations. Some of those have been the result of um, water quality degradation from drought, uh, including the Jewel Lake Rescue, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and we also have some planned translocations on the east side of the Sierras, um, targeted translocations between the waters of the Southern Management Unit, as that was a recommendation that resulted from the genetic work to increase the gene flow between, uh, between the waters and the Southern Management Unit. So we're gonna go out and collect individual fish and, and mix those populations to improve the genetic outlook. In addition, We've uh, seen range changes in the Sacramento perch population statewide over the past 10 years, um, largely because of drought. We lost at least two populations 
on the east side during the uh, last extended drought due to desiccation. So in an effort to combat that range contraction and to improve resilience of the species as a whole, uh, we've been looking for other opportunities to create new populations. And one example of that is Mountain Meadows Reservoir, which is upstream of Lake Almanor. Uh, Mountain Meadows went dry several years ago and um, Northern Region Department staff went out and collected Sacramento perch from several different sources and stocked Mountain Meadows as it was refilling. And um, recent surveys show that that stocking was very successful. And so that's a, a bright spot there. We also uh, wanna make sure we're maintaining and expanding the angler opportunities that we currently have. Um, there are some real popular Sacramento perch fisheries on the east side of the Sierras, um, Crowley Lake in particular. And so uh, we're working to manage those fisheries and make sure that we're maintaining those opportunities for the public and uh, looking for any additional opportunities uh, where they may exist to create new, new angler opportunities. <clears throat> and then finally, um, manage broodstock ponds. One of the biggest challenges we find uh, in trying to expand and enhance Sacramento perch fisheries is the acquisition of fish. The state historically had the Central Valley Fish Hatchery, as Claire mentioned, which uh, produced Sacramento perch in addition to some other warm water fishes, but we currently have no such capacity. And the state also historically had access to Brickyard Pond, uh, which was a pond located in Sacramento that I, again, will go into more detail here in a little bit, but the pond was connected to the Sacramento River at one point and held a remnant population of Sacramento perch that the hatchery used uh, both for its own production and also for translocations. And so without these sources of fish in more recent times, the departments relied mostly on um, translocations uh, for sourcing fish. And these translocations provide several challenges, um, namely the existing populations Many of them are genetically bottlenecked, and so they don't necessarily represent ideal uh, donor sources. They're also distant from many of the locations we want to move fish to, and they're low density fisheries. And so what that all boils down to is they're very expensive to go out and collect from the wild. Um, for example, when we collected tissue samples from Lake Almanor um, for the genetic study, I think I figured it was about 55 hours of staff time for every fish that was collected. Um, so with limited resources, it becomes really difficult to do much when you're relying on translocations. And so we applied for a state wildlife grant um, that will in part identify two locations to develop uh, broodstock sources, one for the Northern Management Unit and one for the Southern Management Unit. And these would be secure waters with uh, populations that are managed for genetics um, and monitored. <clears throat> and so, Looking ahead, having easy access to genetically diverse stock of Sacramento perch would facilitate the department's support of other potential endeavors, um, such as supporting the private aquaculture industry by pointing to a source of genetically healthy brood stock, um, which in turn could support private stocking and aquaponics. Often uh, private landowners who wanna stock their ponds with fish or, or uh, aquaponics enthusiasts turn to non-traditional non-native fish like sunfish, bass, catfish, and tilapia in the, in the case of aquaponics. And so uh, the hope is that we may be able to provide a native fish alternative for these markets. We also wanna expand access to this fish by bringing this fish to the people. This fish was once so plentiful in the valley floor that it supported commercial fisheries. But today, most people have never heard of it, let alone seen it with their own eyes. When a typical angler thinks about a native California sport fish, they think of steelhead, salmon, trout, or sturgeon. And those fish are all wonderful, but they have a high barrier to pursuing them in terms of angling, uh, often requiring a boat, expensive gear, and a large investment in terms of uh, fuel and lodging to travel to distant locations. And so those people looking for more accessible options are usually limited to uh, angling for non-native sunfish, bass, catfish, and seasonal trout plants if they live in a few specific locations around the state. And so this charismatic fish here really has the potential to be what we've referred to as the native sport fish of the people. And we hope to provide more exposure to this fish by expanding both angler opportunities as well as self-sustaining populations, uh, particularly in close proximity to urban centers. <clears throat> 
So all the work that we've done so far wouldn't have been possible without our valuable partners. And the work we plan to do in the future will depend on the continued collaboration among this diverse group of stakeholders. This fish appeals to the conservationist, the angler, the landowner, the Aquarius. Um, Chris Miller at Contra Costa Mosquito Vector Control has even shown that there's potential use for this fish in, in mosquito control in lieu of the controversial mosquito fish. So there's a lot to like about this fish in addition to its natural value as a relic from an ancient ecosystem. And that's apparent in this growing list of eager partners. Through working with this dynamic and expanding group of partners, our goal is to bring this heritage sunfish back to the communities of the Bay Area, Central Valley and beyond and give average Californians an opportunity to interact with a piece of natural history. And so at this point, I'd like to transition and uh, spend some time talking about what's brought us all together here tonight and that's Sacramento Perch and uh, the Yellow Basin. And as Corky and Claire mentioned, uh, as of about six months ago, we have a population of Sacramento perch in the demonstration wetlands behind the headquarters building. And so this is a, a pretty exciting topic for me. And so I'd like to just take a few minutes and give you a snapshot into the journey of this population, um, which has led them to this yellow pond. So uh, the journey of this population of Sacramento perch started at the Brickyard Pond, uh, which has also been referred to as the clay pit. And in this map on the bottom, this is a, a map from 1956 from a Shell Energy Company. And you can see here, uh, it's labeled as the clay pit. This is uh, the Brickyard Pond or clay pit uh, in the pocket area of South Sacramento. And it was, um, previously connected to the Sacramento River and supported a population of Sacramento perch. And um, in 1881, the Sacramento Brick, uh, Brick Company was established in this area and used this clay pit uh, for its production. And by 1890, the Sacramento Brick Company was producing 140,000 bricks a day, uh, which supported the building of Sacramento as well as the rebuilding of San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake. Um, following development and suburban sprawl. The Brick Company was closed in 1971 and uh, supported the sack perch through its entire existence there. And as mentioned, the, the Central Valley Fish Hatchery sourced fish from this location, both for translocations and for uh, production at the hatchery itself. <clears throat> so this is a map here of uh, the Brickyard Pond and you can see adjacent to the city of Sacramento. And so this was the starting point of this population. And the next stop for this population was Lake Anza, which uh, is a lake in the East Bay in the hills above Berkeley in Tilden Regional Park. This here is a picture of Lake Anza, uh, which was built in 1938. It was chemically treated after it was refilled and then first stocked with Sacramento perch in 1953. The source of those fish uh, is unclear. It's, there's no documentation. They may have been brickyard fish or they may have been locally sourced from an Alameda population. But Lake Anza was supplementally stocked in 1964 and 65 and um, we do have documentation of those stocking events by the Central Valley Fish Hatchery and those fish did come from the brickyard pond. In the 1970s largemouth bass were introduced into Anza and uh, by 1983, the Sacramento perch population was extirpated from Anza. But thankfully there's another small lake on wildcat drainage downstream of Anza called Jewel Lake. And that's the next stop of this population. This here is a picture of Jewel Lake. There's no documentation of the fish being intentionally introduced into Jewel. So the assumption is that uh, they colonized Jewel from outflow from Lake Anza. But they were first documented in Jewel Lake in 1986 and thrived there until at least uh, 2006 when uh, during high outflow events there was a, a large amount of sediment deposited in the reservoir which reduced the capacity and reduced the average depth of the reservoir to just a couple feet. So then during the drought uh, with the reduced capacity of the reservoir the water got extremely low and uh, we worked with East Bay Regional Parks District to assess the conditions and we came to the conclusion that it was unlikely that Jewel Lake was going to be able to sustain this population through the rest of that year. And so um, the department facing 
uh, widespread drought conditions, was forced to triage and, and prioritize all of the different needs and all the different threats. And when looking at this population, we went back to the Schwartz and May paper and, and found that the Jewel Lake fish had some unique genetics. Um, they had some alleles that were not uh, found in any other populations. And so the department prioritized this population uh, for a rescue. And in August of 2014, we went in and did a two day rescue um, collecting 178 individual fish. And this upper picture here is the largest fish that was collected during that rescue at uh, just over eight inches. In the lower fish, uh, lower picture, you can see the, the conditions. Uh, we were actually driving in the lake bed to launch the boat there and it was too shallow to run, run the motor. So we were poke pulling around with this electro fishing boat to collect the fish. And so, um, as we were rescuing this fish, these fish, it just so happened that at Gray Lodge Wildlife Area, they were uh, constructing a new pond. And so the determination was made that these fish would be destined for Gray Lodge Wildlife Area. And so, as I mentioned, they were, had just finished constructing a four and a half acre pond. Um, and so we worked with the habitat shop and the wildlife area staff and uh, were able to get some screens placed in the water control structures for the intake in an effort to exclude any non-native fish. Um, and the wildlife area staff also added some complex habitat, including some deep water, um, some large woody debris and, and native tules. So this upper photo is staff installing one of the fish screens in the water control structure. And the lower photo is um, the stocking of Sacramento perch into the Gray Lodge pond uh, following the rescue. So the following spring, we went out to monitor the population um, and we were able to document successful reproduction. This is a photo of one of the first young of the year, uh, Sacramento perch that was collected at Gray Lodge. But unfortunately during the same survey, we uh, did document the presence of green sunfish, bluegill, largemouth bass and golden shiner. And so the, the screens uh, were not effective at excluding the non-native species. And this population been, has been monitored with annual surveys uh, ever since and has continued to show fewer and fewer juveniles each year. And so in 2019, um, we decided to try to estimate the total abundance of Sacramento perch in this population. And we did that through a market capture study. And uh, a market capture study is a method to estimate abundance by going out and collecting individuals, marking those individuals so they're identifiable and returning them to the population. And then going back out, collecting more individuals and through the ratio of marked to unmarked individuals, you can get an estimation of total abundance. And this uh, photo on the right you can see is showing the marks we used, which were a fin clip on the soft uh, dorsal fin. Um, and those soft rays grow back remarkably quickly. Um, so these marks are only identifiable for a couple months. But this study uh, was a 10 night survey that was conducted over the course of 30 days. And this study, uh, we ended up collecting over 3,500 non-native fish that were removed from the pond and 99 unique adult perch, which were marked which resulted in an estimated 425 adults in the entire population. And so there was some good news here that uh, we now had 425 adults when we started with 178 fish. However, um, there's some bad news too with 3,500 non-natives. Um, it doesn't, didn't seem like this was a sustainable option for the Sacramento perch. And so we began the search for alternative locations for this population. And so that brings us to the YOLO demonstration wetlands after this 68 year and 263 uh, mile journey that this population had been on. In uh, 2020, we went out to the demonstration wetlands to conduct some fish surveys just to confirm that there were no non-native centrarchids. And thankfully the only fish that turned up in those surveys were mosquito fish. Um, and so it was decided that we were gonna go ahead and move forward with relocating those fish from Gray Lodge to the demonstration wetland. And so uh, fall of 2021, over the course of six days, we moved 57 Sacramento perch from Gray Lodge to Yolo. 
man, those fish um, ranged in size from a little over an inch to about seven and a half inches. And this is a photograph here of uh, one of the first stocking events into the demonstration wetlands. And so uh, what does the future of the Sacramento perch and the yellow demonstration wetlands hold? Um, well, it's our hope that the demonstration wetlands provide a safe haven for this population and represent the final stop of a long journey. We do plan continued translocations to salvage as many of the remaining fish from Gray Lodge as possible and also to enhance this viola population by ensuring we have a genetically robust founding population. Um, we plan to begin monitoring this population this fall to, to look for uh, successful recruitment of juveniles. And uh, we plan to continue to work with the wildlife area staff and the Yellow Basin Foundation to tell the story of this fish to all the numerous visitors that the demonstration wetlands attracts every year. And so with that, I just want to thank everybody and uh, be happy to field any questions that people may have. Thanks, Claire and Max. I'm, I'm hoping that we will have some questions. Usually they come up in chat, um, although there's we don't have a massive group. So if somebody wants to ask a question out loud, we could do that as well. We're pretty excited about having them here. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's a unique opportunity for us to describe, um, you know, the, the efforts that you all have in trying to, to save uh, this species and others. So, Corky, this yeah. is Robin. Hi, Robin. Uh, hi, I'm Robin Kaleko. And I was wondering. Robin, should I continue? Your audio isn't very good. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'll just type it. Okay. Okay. Um, we have a couple of other questions that came in while Robin's typing up hers. Um, one is, how different are these from tule perch? Um, I can take that one if you want, Claire. Um, so they're quite different. Um, so tule perch are what we refer to as a, a true perch. Um, they're more closely related to surf perch, whereas Sacramento perch are actually a sunfish and not a true perch. And so um, tule perch, like surf perch, actually give birth to live young, whereas the Sacramento perch uh, has habits more similar to, to sunfish and in, in laying eggs in a nest. Um, so while they, they may look somewhat similar, they're, they're pretty divergent in terms of their history. Are populations in higher elevation cool lakes doing well? I can start this one, Max, and then you can add if you'd like. Um, several populations in the higher elevation cool lakes are doing well. Um, one of the reasons for this is that um, cool water, cooler water generally excludes the other competitors that severely impact Sacramento perch. Um, and while Sacramento perch can withstand warmer water conditions, um, they still seem to do well reproducing in cooler temperatures too. Um, the, while they were evolved in um, the more slow water and slough environments, they can also do well in reservoirs. Max, do you wanna add anything to that? No. Nope. Okay. okay. So the next question is, so raising these fish in a hatchery is not an option. Where is the CV fish hatchery that you mentioned? So the Central Valley Fish Hatchery was located in Elk Grove. It's no longer operational. And the department doesn't have, uh, that was the only warm water fish hatchery that the department has. And so... Uh, the remaining hatcheries are all cold water hatcheries and are not set up for rearing this type of fish. Um, and actually a lot of the rearing of this fish happened in earthen ponds where they were placed in ponds and allowed to, to spawn naturally. 
Um, so, so the department does not have the facilities to accommodate spawning or rearing of, of Sacramento perch at this time. And based on the stocking records that we have, while so, a lot of fish were sourced from the hatchery, um, a really large portion of them were also sourced from Brick, Brickyard Pond, which was not directly managed. Is that correct, Max? Right. Um, is there information that can be given to the public who visit the ponds or that Yolo Basin Foundation could put on the website? We are working on outreach materials um, and we can certainly make that happen for you. We would like to create um, some placards that can be put at the pond if you're interested and then we can also produce handouts and whatever other educational opportunities might be useful. So Robin says thanks. She, it sounds like she likes that idea. Okay. Um, <laughs> Robin is the founder of Yola Basin Foundation. Oh, so, thank you, Robin. Uh, yes, let's keep talking about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how are you monitoring the population at the Yola headquarters? So we haven't actually began monitoring activities yet. Um, so there's a couple different ways we can do that. Uh, one is going in and doing electrofishing surveys, which uh, temporarily stuns the fish so that we can take measurement data. Uh, the other option is we have traps that are called clover traps um, that you can place in the water and the fish use them as, as habitat and you come in and check them periodically. And since this is a pretty new population and this is about the time they're spawning, we want to give them some time to get established before we start that monitoring activity. Um, we'll probably end up utilizing the clover traps, uh, at least initially, and those are most effective on the juvenile fish. And at this point, the juvenile fish are probably too small to trap. But in the fall, uh, we should get some good information on, on recruitment of juveniles using those clover traps. It'd be fun to hear. Um, Sacramento perch don't breed with other species, no hybrids? Not that I know of. They're the only, only species of their genus. So they're, they're, uh, they're, they're not as closely related to all the other sunfishes as they are, as the other sunfishes are related to each other, where we do see that hybridization. Um, it, it may be possible, but I'm not aware of it occurring, especially not in the wild. I'm not either, and their evolutionary split was a really long time ago, which might prevent hybridization as well. Are there catchable fish in Crowley Lake? Yes. Definitely. What kind? Uh, there's Sacramento perch. Nice. Yeah, yeah, nice. there's a, a really robust fishery there. Um, it's got a, a pretty strong fall angler following there. There's people that travel there just to catch the Sacramento perch. It also has a, a really robust trout fishery there. So um, it's a popular destination with anglers. And one thing that I didn't mention as part of the timeline, but I think is really interesting is um, Sacramento perch were introduced into Crowley um, either in the early 60s or slightly before then, but they were noticed by the department in the early 60s. And there was a point in time where the department had to make a decision about whether or not to, to try to manage away from Sacramento perch um, in favor of the trout population. But then the decision was made to, to leave them and to not try to manage away from Sacramento perch. And it's resulted in a really robust population and fishery. What role might private aquaculture play to supplement the department's lack of, hit, of hatchery capacity? That's a good question. And that's something we've discussed a lot um, internally. Um, you know, they've got a lot of the facilities, they've got a lot of the know-how. Um, it's, it may come down to uh, facilitating getting fish into their hands and which is the first step is getting those brood stock ponds that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, going out and trying to collect enough fish to create brood stock sources for 
a variety of different private um, private growers from the wild is, is is a pretty difficult task. And so, our hope is that if we're able to develop these broodstock sources um, that have easily accessible fish that we know have good genetics, that we can uh, get those into the grower's hand, and then and that at that point they could uh, really ramp up production. Um, I don't know, Claire, you have anything else to add on that? I think you covered it. It's definitely something that we're um, actively looking to pursue, um, especially once we get the a, a solid bridge stock source that we can utilize as the department. Are otters a threat? Otters will will eat Sacramento perch. Um, but you know, Sacramento perch have evolved with a lot of different predators, and direct predation does not seem to be a, a real major concern for them. Um, they will get their fair share, but it, without the the threats of all the non-native species, um, it seems that they're they probably can the population can withstand that that predation from auditors or or birds um, or even other fish. We have several populations of Sacramento perch that are thriving with uh, other bass species uh, in the same lake. Um, not, not with sunfish as well. They seem to be the, the biggest concern, but uh, Lake Almanor uh, has a really robust smallmouth bass population and also a strong Sacramento perch population. Um, Crowley has mentioned that the trout feed heavily on the Sacramento perch there, um, but they're, they're able to coexist there as well. So, um, so direct predation doesn't seem to be a real, a real driving force in extirpation. Um, how deep does the water need to be for successful spawning? There's not a ton of literature on the spawning, but they have a pretty wide range in, in depth. Uh, so in, in terms of the spawning itself, a couple feet in depth, uh, they'll be able to, to have successful spawning um, as long as all the other conditions are, are good. Um, so the, the deeper the water, generally that's... Uh, that provides some refuge from predators. And so having complex habitat with varying depth uh, provides that spawning habitat as well as that deep water refuge and foraging habitat. So if I catch one at Crowley Lake, should I release it? That's, that's yeah, that, that's really up to the angler. Um, there, you know, it's a, it's a pretty abundant uh, population there. There's a lot of people that enjoy catching them and, and eating them. Um, and so, you know, if you want to go there and catch and release, that's great. If you, if you want to go there and harvest a few and, and see how they taste, that's, uh, that's great too. So. Okay. Um, one of the guests commented that years ago, a graduate student in Dr. Moyle's lab studied Sacramento perch versus hitch in their two and a half acre um, pond near Davis. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. Thank you for making that available. We learned uh, if, a lot from those studies. Hello. If these perch are netted, what makes them attractive? Wait, if these perch are netted, what makes them attractive sport fish? Maybe some of the use need that advantage. I'm not um, sure what the question is, but I'm, I'm thinking it's what, what makes them attractive as a sport fish. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty hardy fighters um, like crappie are and, and, you know, crappie have a pretty uh, strong angler following, especially in the Midwest. They also can get uh, pretty big. I think the state record is around five pounds. Um, and then I haven't personally eaten one, but I, I hear they're actually pretty good table fare as well. So I think the combination of, of the sport, the, the fight they put up, the size, and the fact that they eat well um, makes them attractive to a lot of anglers. And I, I'm not sure, but I believe that the netting comment might refer to what I spoke about uh, with how Native peoples used to catch perch. And that probably had a lot to do with the habitat conditions and the density of fish that existed at the time. Um, that might have also been the smaller fish that were more accessible to catch using those methods. 
Robin shares that the same YOLO demonstration ponds were used to study Sacramento split tail in the early 2000s. Ted Summers monitored them by snorkeling. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think, guys? You're coming out to snorkel to figure out what's up in our pond? Maybe. Maybe. That would be kind of interesting. There, you could find all kinds of amazing things out there, I would yeah. imagine. Um, are there potential disease issues that are un uniquely of concern in these fish um, that are put into the aquaculture business more frequently? If these fish are put into the aquaculture, sorry, I read that wrong. So are there disease, potential disease issues? There are probably the same potential diseases that are seen with other centrarchids. Um, so largemouth bass are pretty prevalent in the aquaculture industry, as well as some other sunfishes. And so uh, pathology would, would certainly be a consideration uh, if these fish are, are brought into the industry. Um, I'm not aware of any unique disease concerns to this species, um, but I know, Claire, you might have more to add. I'm not aware. Um... We are conducting pathology testing on populations before we engage in translocation activities. Um, so if we find any, we can certainly share that information. I am not seeing more questions coming in. I appreciate that you um, shared your knowledge. Pretty exciting uh, to have science going on out here, not just science that we share with the children, but science that um, has other implications. Uh, and if, if you can get us more information, then that would be, uh, that would be great. We'd love to be able to post that and share that. Oh, a couple more things did come in. Um, is that one in the picture on this page? Yeah, that's a photograph that was taken at Lake Almanor of a, of a large Sacramento perch in the shallows. Wow. That's a sizable fish. Yeah. Um, do we anticipate finding eggs in the demonstration uh, area for the school kids? Uh, in terms of finding them, I, I'm not sure. Uh, if that question is regarding specifically going out and, and searching for, for eggs, um, that would probably be difficult, um, but we're, we're hoping that, I'm not sure what the temperature in the pond is right now, but they've probably already been spawning, so there may be, uh, there may even be juveniles, uh, larval fish swimming around right now. Um, so our hope is that there will definitely be, be eggs um, and uh, at least juveniles to see in the shallows here soon. We have activities um, the, when students come on field trips and also at California Duck Days where kids put on boots and go into the pond um, with little nets to find, mostly they're finding the, the invertebrates that live there, but sometimes we get some mosquito fish along the way. So I guess we're going to have to keep our eyes open, aren't we? Yeah, I'll be real, real curious to hear the results of those, uh, those little surveys. There you go. Well, we definitely will let you know if something other than a mosquito fish shows up in our net. That'd be great. Uh, you have several comments that are coming in. Um, <laughs> this kind of science is exciting. Thank you. Uh, several thank yous. Um, oh, and someone wants to know if the fish can actually be seen at YOLO. So they're pretty cryptic fish in general. Um, even when we're going out with an electrofishing boat trying to find them, they're pretty difficult to find. And while it's a pretty small pond, 57 fish is a, is a really small number. Uh, so I'd say it's possible, uh, especially if they're up spawning, but um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if nobody's seen any of those fish and they're, they're deep in the, in the structure and the habitat. Do they tend to hide? Yes. yes. They're really good at hiding. But hopefully if we do get the population to expand, it might be more possible to see fish as the density increases. Hopefully not in the mouth of an otter. 
thank you. Thank you so much um, for, for sharing with us this, this, this evening uh, at, and for providing this incredible science opportunity. Um, we look forward to finding out what happens. I do want to circle back and remind people that uh, coming up just around the corner, uh, we do have California Duck Days. So hopefully you'll come out and who knows, maybe you'll bring a child who will go out in a pair of boots and with their little net, maybe they'll find uh, one of these small fish. But thank you again uh, to both you, Claire and Max, uh, for sharing your knowledge with us and the fish uh, in the pond. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak tonight. And for sharing your pond. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a, it's a good partnership. Have a great night. You too.